I am not here to promote biostimulants or not promote them. I'm just here to tell you what uh, I've worked with it. The, the hardest thing about biostimulants is getting a, a definition of what exactly it is. And biostimulants any substance or microorganism applied to plants that will enhance nutritional efficiency, abi uh, help with abiotic stress tolerance, and or crop quality traits. And the biggest one I found is the abiotic stress tolerance. And so it helps when the plants are stressed. <clears throat> I have seen some improvements. It's not consistent improvement. It's a slight improvement sometimes. Sometimes it's a little more improvement. If I get no stress, and the stress could be caused by uh, several different things, whether it's fertilizer stress or insects or disease, it seems to help the plant. If I don't have that stress, I don't see any differences. Now what distinguishes biostimulants from other crop inputs? And the one thing that kills me about when they sell biostimulants, almost all of them, or many of them, I should say, have fertilizers in them. And so when you use a, a, a fertilizer of any type and you spray it onto the plant, What's probably going to happen to that plant a little bit? Yes, you have to answer. What do you think happens? You apply a little bit of foliar fertilizer. Yes, very good. It's going to green up. It's going to green up. And that's what happens. And so you put this biostimulant on that has foliar fertilizers and the plants green up a little bit. And people say, oh, look at that. The, the biostimulant is working. When in fact, it's it's the nutrients. Now they're saying in the definition that's regardless of any of the fertilizer you put in, the biostimulant is going to work separately from that. Okay? And it doesn't have any action on pests. It doesn't have any direct action on the pests, in keeping the pests off or reducing pest numbers. But a lot of the biopesticides are considered biostimulants under certain circumstances. And we'll talk a little bit more about those circumstances here in a little bit. Where I'm using a biopesticide that actually can be used as a biostimulant at the same time. But it, it depends on where it is on the plant. And I'll, and I'll talk about why that is. So crop biostimulation is just comp complementary to the crop nutrition and crop protection. So that's their definition. That the biostimulant is separate from fertilizer is separate from protecting the plant from pests and it's going to promote the plant's growth. How you separate that out at times, you really can't and that's the difficulty. This is just an example of some of the composition of some of the biostimulants I was working with and other biostimulants I found. So you see you got manganese, zinc, and then they throw in some free amino acids and organic matter and nitrogen, phosphorus. So you got a whole bunch of different things. The, the free amino acids would be considered the biostimulants in this. The other things are the fertilizers. And that's what you often find. You're going to get fertilizer in with a biostimulant. So make sure. Fertilizer, you mean nutrition. Is that right? Yes, fertilizer, nutrition, same thing. Plant nutrition. Another one would be organic nitrogen, potassium, organic matter, and humic extract. Uh, extract. Uh, this one has a little bit uh, fewer nutrients, but again, they almost always have a, a bunch of nutrients in with them. So you have to take that in consideration when you're looking at this. This is a market forecast. This is not my forecast. Sorry. This is a market forecast for biostimulants uh, the next uh, five, six years. And you see that it's going to increase with time. And so this is one of the reasons I'm working and looking at biostimulants is whether or not they're useful, or whether or not they're going to be helpful. Yes? Is something as simple as compost tea? That's a good question. It, it, it probably is. He, uh, because it has uh, microorganisms in it that are going to affect the plant one way or the other. And it has the nutrients, it has the fertilizers in it too. So a compost tea could be thought of it as a biostimulant. Okay. Uh, through the last couple of years, I've talked to growers, and this is some of the things they say. I've changed some of the words and dropped some of the words that they've used. 
Uh, some of the things, hey, they can't hurt and it may help. That's sort of an attitude. Biostimulants aren't real expensive uh, on a per acre basis. So, you know, why not go ahead and try it? Everyone can't be wrong. Must be something there or we want to be talking about it now. And the beneficial microbes, as in compost tea, and their effects on the crop are known to be positive. And we've seen a lot of research over the last 20 years that show that microorganism and microbes put in the right place at the right time can help the plant grow. And then the last one, which I've changed quite a bit, is uh, snake oil. So <clears throat> there's something there. The growers are kind of curious about it and they're interested, but uh, they're, they're also uh, wary of it. So researchers and crop advisors, <clears throat> what, what are some of the things uh, we say potentially useful inputs, but we, we don't know how best to use them or when to use them. Growers are curious about them, so I need to know something about them because growers are going to ask me about it. And little or marginally useful third party information. That's that's a big one. Uh, you see these advertisements and you see uh, them promoting this and how well it's helped plants grow and da 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 da. And you're wondering where does this information come from? It's rather difficult sometimes to do get it down to exactly where it came from, who did the research, for how long was the research done, and in what circumstance it was done. But they're always great at saying that, that this has really helped yield. And of course then it's snake oil. All right, these are some uh, just general ingredients in white and yellow. In the yellow are the ones I've worked with over the last four or five years. So mycorrhizae, uh, I can tell you right now, works pretty well, but not in all uh, situations. Could you put that last slide back, please? Trying to get it closer, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, these are others, uh, chemical activators, plant extracts, plant hormones. The thing with a lot of these is the plant extracts, the plant hormones, the chemical activators, cytokinin, are all rolled into the same thing. And so you, it's difficult to separate them out at times. And so you get the whole package. Mm -hmm. And here's a bunch more. Mm -hmm. So I worked with these. I've tried to separate them out as best I could over time to use just that one factor to see how well it works. Um, could you just talk about the mycorrhiza for a minute? You mentioned sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Does that have to do with endo versus acto? If, and, and brassicas that don't need them, they have no effect. What is the basis of you saying sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't? Well, uh, the basis is that sometimes I get a yield enhancement, sometimes I get a better looking plant, sometimes, uh, depending on what I'm looking at, whether I'm looking at the uh, amount of nutrients are in the plant, mm -hmm. uh, the root size, mm -hmm. the foliage size, mm -hmm. I see no difference. Mm -hmm. Other times I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't really know why there's a difference. Okay. Uh, endo and ecto, ecto uh, mycorrhizae is going to do nothing for vegetables. Right. Uh, the endo mycorrhizae, depending on which one you get at the right time, mm -hmm. uh, can do a real, uh, decent job. Mm -hmm. It can help the plant. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. It can help the plant. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to help the plant all the time. Right. And also, <coughs> is it, is it, I mean, helping the plant, isn't that an effect? Isn't it that it's helping the soil and whatever plant No, it's more, it, it is helping the soil to some degree, but it's helping the plant a lot more mm -hmm. by reaching out and getting a larger surface area mm -hmm. and taking up uh, water and other nutrients, especially mm -hmm. phosphorus. Right, right. If you have a lot of phosphorus in your soil, which we do have a lot of phosphorus in a lot of our soils mm -hmm. uh, from using chicken manure over the years, mm -hmm. Uh, the mycorrhizae just doesn't do a very good job mm -hmm. uh, helping the plant. Mm -hmm. And what happens, and what some studies have found, that the mycorrhizae, if it infects the plant, which it usually does, and the plant already has a lot of phosphorus, mm -hmm. it, it, it's actually detrimental to the right. plant. Too much. It, it's, it, it infects the plant, mm -hmm. and so it starts to draw off nutrients from the plant, okay. but doesn't give anything in return. Okay. And so in cases like that, it's not beneficial. Mm -hmm. do, when, when yeah. you say sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't, do you mean sometimes your studies 
show a positive effect and sometimes the study shows no effect? Or do you mean like in a study this plant has helped in this plant? No, it's different between studies, yeah, okay. between plots and years. So there are studies where show this, this entire treatment mm -hmm. is doing better. Yes. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. And uh, by plant hormones, what specifically are you referring to? Uh, oh, hormones that are being sold as biostimulants. What are they? Oh, there, there's different types of, of hormones, some that uh, gibberellic acid that help uh, growth of the plant. And there's cytokinins that help uh, cell reproduction. How are those derived generally? You'll have to ask them. I, I have no idea. They Probably what they've done is taking uh, seaweed or sea kelp okay. and strained it out of there and then are able to remove it from that. Uh, they don't produce it uh, in a chemistry set, but they, they get it from plants. They extract? Yes. So earlier on you had, um, I thought I saw seaweed or something related to seaweed. Uh -huh. So how was the performance of using seaweed as a, an amendment? We're going to get to that. Okay. okay. Uh, these are some of the results. Uh, no differences was when I consistently saw no differences when I used this particular biostimulant. Some trends, and I'll show you what I mean by trends, but by trends is where I use the biostimulant, I see differences. I see slightly greater, not necessarily yields, uh, but more nutrients in the plant, uh, uh, moto, more uh, phytosynthates in the plants, um, uh, photosynthates, I mean, uh, chlorophyll. just. Little, little things, and it's not always significantly different, but there's always a trend. It always seems to be greater than the control. Okay. Uh, a few statistical differences. That means that during the season, and I take my samples, uh, I was getting statistically greater amounts of uh, chlorophyll, let's say, in the uh, biostimulant treatment versus the control. And so, but then, Two samples later, there's no difference and there's no difference. And if I look at the total for the year, uh, total for that season, there are no differences. But during the season, I see some differences and it's statistically different. Do you have a question? Yeah, with something like mycorrhizae, um, when you're setting up the plots, do you have a method for establishing that there is no baseline population of the mycorrhizae? No, no. It's, uh, uh, the plants are infected with other mycorrhizae that are in the soil. Uh, this is just a boost of using mycorrhizae. And I use it, I start it at transplants. So when I'm growing the transplants in a greenhouse, they're growing in sterile media. So there should be no other organism there. And so then I infect it with the mycorrhizae. So it should start off with having greater amounts of mycorrhizae in it. Does mycorrhizae come into the field? Yes, it does. <laughs> So basically, you grow them sterile, you inoculate them with mycorrhizae and as you're transplanting them. Yes? Yeah. Okay. And so, um, how, how do they get any, any other mycorrhizae treatment or spray after that? Or is that it? That's just the one? They usually get uh, uh, treatment during the season, depending on what treatment it is and what the experiment so, so let's say a 120 day 100 day crop they usually get another treatment uh, about two to three weeks after they go out okay. and then another two to three weeks after that okay, okay so uh, you see I did get significant difference with seaweed and I'm going to talk about that study in silico and I'm going to talk about that study next Okay, this is silicone use in vegetables. This is something that Rutgers did a number of years ago. They looked at strictly calcium silicate at the rate of 7,800 pounds of calcium per acre. So they used quite a bit. Fungicides were applying a 2 by 2 factorial. I'm not going to go into it uh, much detail. Is that they found differences uh, when they were looking at this. And, they get away with using uh, 7,800 pounds of calcium silicate because they're using it as a liming material. And you can use calcium silicate on almost a one-to-one -one basis with lime. 
so it will act as a limey material this is the one thing I've worked with silicone in sprays and people have sold this as you, you use the silicone and you spray it on your plant and it helps your plant survive better it protects your plant from insects feeding on the leaves it helps the flowers stay on the plant longer the flowers are in better shape because of the silicone the silicone sprays never work I've never seen them work we just did a study about four years ago with all along the eastern seaboard from down in Miami all the way up to Maine all along that way we used we looked at this spraying the silicone onto the plant to see if we saw any differences and not one university saw any differences in the sprays the sprays are useless and that's because you cannot get enough silicone the silicone has to become part of the plant structure for it to help the plant spraying it on does very little if anything to help the plant so would you suggest then inoculating the seed as you're sprouting it no it, you've got to have a lot of cal, uh, uh, silicone in the soil in the soil inoculating is, isn't going to do any good what's the rate that you want to have occurring of the silicone in the soil i looked at four thousand pounds per acre, per acre. But that will depend on how much lime you need. If you don't need the, that much lime, then uh, I wouldn't suggest you use it because then it's just too expensive to do. 400, 4,000. 4,000. 4, okay, in my 2013 study, I looked at the foliar diseases of powdery mildew and downy mildew. And I also looked at the soil diseases caused by Fusarium and Phytophthora in pumpkin. Okay, I looked at two of the things, so, silicone fertilizer, which induces physical defense, and that it's involved in induced chemical defenses, that SAR effect, systemic acquired resistance. And in this study I did back then, I used a product called Stimplex. I don't own Stimplex. <laughs> I don't get any money from Stimplex from doing this, okay? All right, but it's a seed weed. It's uh, work is done up in Canada. It's a general crop biostimulant, and that is what it's sold as a general crop biostimulant, not as a fertilizer. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to help induce chemical defenses again. Okay, so this is my study powdery mildew. So I, I compared powdery mildew resistant pumpkins with non resistant pumpkins with and without silicone and with and without the Stimplex. So 4,000 pounds of calcium silicate, made five applications of Stimplex through the drip tube during the season. Pots were 50 rows, eight foot centers, three foot between plants on plastic, four replications, Whew, June 5th, no fungicides used. All right, this is powdery mildew up in the left. You can see just getting started on down here on the right. You see it's infecting the plant uh, fairly substantially. Powdery mildew will reduce yields, but uh, it's not a, a real plant killer or a real plant reducer, uh, yield reducer, but it, it is there. Okay, unfortunately this is a little dark. I'm gonna summarize this. I'm not gonna go through all of this. The difference I found was that powdery mildew resistant plants did better than powdery mildew non-resistant plants. Okay, so we, that's what we expect to see. So that was good. The thing a little surprising is anything that had silicone in the treatment did better than when silicone was not. So if we compare just this one and this one, this top one with this green one down below, you see you got a 3.3 versus a 1.7 rating. And everything being equal except silicone was added. Okay. Now, if you add Stimplex, it drops even a little bit more. If you have come down here, where you have no powdery mildew resistance, it goes up a bit. So the powdery mildew resistance, of course, helps. And so in this case, it looks like the silicone's helping with the powdery mildew and reducing it. Now, downy mildew is the real yield killer. And even if you have your pumpkins just about ready to harvest in a week or two, or a couple weeks, this, uh, getting hit with downy mildew will reduce uh, 
the marketability of the pumpkins. Uh, the, the handles will tend to rot and the pumpkins will tend to rot once they get hit with downy mildew. So you can see the beginning of it up in the left and then what happens over time, it just kills the leaves. And so you can have a field that is, has no leaves in it after about two weeks. Okay, I'm only going to look at these two. These are the two lowest powdery mildew ratings and they're both when silicone and Stimplex are together. And so when you add these two together, they seem to work synergistically in reducing downy mildew. If you look at them separately, they do okay, but they're not significantly different from much. And this is what I talk about when I see a trend. You see, there's, there's no difference between this one and almost all the rest of them except this one. See, anything that has the same letter is not statistically different. Okay? So you can see everything has an A except this one. So this one is statistically different. Its rating is lower than anything with an A. So it, it is much different. It is significantly different. The rest of these, even though there's a difference between them, they're not significantly different. So to st statistically, st st the statistics say there is no difference. Okay? And this is why I talk about trends. If there's no difference with this one, but the trend is when I use this, there's less downy mildew. But it's not statistical. Okay? You see what I mean by statistical as versus a trend? And this is what I see often, or sometimes I should say, uh, with using uh, these biostimulants. I see a trend over time, but I don't see any statistical differences. All right, and these are yields, and the yields pretty much hold with the downy mildews. Again, when you combine the silicone and the Stimplex, you get a boost in yields compared to the control. So this is the, one of the controls. The one on top is the other control. Powdery mildew resistant, nothing else. No powdery mildew resistance, no other additive, and they're different. All right. This is a field of pumpkins I had one year, and they were just devastated, as you can see, with uh, Phytophthora and Fusarium. I had both these soil diseases in this particular field. So I looked at the, this, I kept it out of cucurbit production for three years, which will help, but it's not going to stop it. Uh, corn, soybean, corn rotation, and then I grew gladiator pumpkins with and without silicone and with and without Stimplex. Okay, I'm just going to go right to it. Uh, soil disease study, this is the loss of plants, percent of plant, dead plants, and you see, when I add the two together, I get a significant reduction compared to the control in the percent of dead plants in September. It's significantly different even when I just use Stimplex, although Stimplex helps quite a bit. Silicone helps a little bit compared to the control, but when I add the two together, you get this synergistic effect. And this is something I've sort of seen in the last couple years with other biostimulants is that if you try to use just one biostimulant, it doesn't seem to do much. But oftentimes, if you combine biostimulants, especially the biological ones, and, and, uh, the microorganism ones, you seem to get more response when you put them together. And I'll show you some research about that. And these are the yields. Again, they, they go by the amount of dead plants. Uh, when you combine silicone and Stimplex, you get a significant yield boost. Now this is in pumpkins. Not, I didn't try this in tomatoes or any of the other vegetables. All right. Any questions? I'm, I'm assuming you don't have any questions. As I go about this, just go ahead and ask. Okay. So when you say pumpkins, that would also fit in with cucumbers? I, I can't say that. It's just pumpkins. How about squashes? Uh, just pumpkins. Okay. Striped cucumber beetle, something that's a problem with organic growers. Uh, did a study with working with uh, Kate Everts on this. Uh, the beetles do a lot of chewing on the plant, 
and when they chew on the plant they transmit a bacterium or any tracheophila which gets in the plant and causes bacterial wilt. What, do they have a natural predator like frogs or anything? Yeah, they might have some frogs but uh, they, the natural enemies don't do a very good job against them. And so it causes bacterial wilt in the plant and so this is one of the things I wanted to look at. So I looked at Bavaria bassiana. Does everybody know Bavaria bassiana? Okay, it's a fungus. It's an animal pathogenic fungus. Doesn't attack the plant, only attacks the insect. The spores attach to the insect, insect's cuticle. The spores germinate and the, the um, mycelia go into the insect and consume the insect from the inside and then killing the insect. And then they sporulate, which is what these guys are doing right here. These guys have been killed by Bavaria bassiana. They're dead. And now the fungus is sporulating. It's going to release spores. And so it starts the epidemic all over again. So this is one of the things you want to do, is get an epidemic going to wipe out the insect pest. And is there any downside once the insects are wiped out to the fungus spreading to do anything else? No, it's a naturally occurring fungus. It's out in your field every year. Again, you're just concentrating it and making it more available. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so when insects come in contact with it, uh, when you spray the material on the foliage, okay? Now, when the, the Bavaria bassiana has the ability to become an endophyte, and an endophyte is a organism that lives inside the plant and that lives in between the cells. And we have endophytic uh, fungi and endophytic uh, bacteria all the time. And anytime you eat lettuce or any, just about any vegetable, you're eating endophytes. It's just something we co-evolved with over time. And so what I wa was interested in was trying to establish Bavaria bassiana as an endophyte in the plant. And so we take plant samples like this and we grow it on special auger that the Bavaria likes and we sterilize the outside of the, the plant sample that we have. And so anytime you get any growth that you see in, in the middle sample there, that is Bavaria. And it came from the inside of the plant. It couldn't come from the outside of the plant because the outside of the plant has been sterilized. And that's why you see no growth from these others. But you see it from this one because that is where the endophyte was. So Bavaria was acting as an endophyte. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's one of the things I wanted to look at was how much of an endophyte would this be? Damn. And so I looked at the roots, uh, lower stem, upper stem, and the middle stems and the leaves. And I found basically that about 50% of these uh, leaf plant parts were inf affected with Bavaria bassiana as an endophyte. Now sometimes it was a little bit lower than that. And that's mostly in the uh, stems in the middle and the upper part of the plant. And it's difficult to get uh, Bavaria to grow through the stems and establish itself in the stems. But in the foliage and in the roots it was quite active as an endophyte. So I was quite excited about this. So we had uh, the Bavaria on top of the plant. I sprayed it on top of the plant during the season. And then it went into the plant and became a endophyte. So I figured that's pretty good. We got it on top of the plant, inside the plant. So then I looked at beetle numbers. And there were no differences in beetle numbers. None. So I looked at, well, okay, maybe the, the beetles sat on the plant and then died and we counted them. And, but they didn't do as much chewing. So I looked at the amount of foliage damage. No differences. So it didn't cut back on beetles and it did not cut back on them feeding on the plant. So I was very discouraged about this. So then I looked at the amount of bacterial wilt. And that's where I got differences of bacterial wilt. First two years and you see that there was a lot of difference, 2015, 2016. Significantly less bacterial wilt where I had the Bavaria 
versus where I did not have the Bavaria. In 2017, there wasn't any significant difference, mostly because uh, the control was a lot lower in bacteria. Well, I just didn't have a lot of beetles uh, last year. And so they just didn't transmit much bacterial will at this time. So the Bavaria didn't seem to help with the reducing beetle numbers or reducing the feeding of the beetles, but it did help reduce the amount of bacteria wilt in the plant, which helped with yields. <clears throat> now, one of the things you might be asking yourself, and I did, is that in 2015, I expect the difference in 2016 because there are more plants dead in the, uh, the, uh, the control versus the Bavaria Bassian. But in 2017, there really wasn't much difference. And yet I had highly significant differences between in the yield. And so what I attribute this to is that the Bavaria, when it acts as an endophyte, is doing something to increase the yield in the plant. Exactly what it's doing and how it's doing that, I don't know. But when it works as an endophyte, it seems to help the plant with yield. Okay. So it didn't help reduce beetle numbers. It did re re reduce the level of plants that succumb to bacteria wilt. And other studies have demonstrated that Bavaria bassiana can reduce the severity and infection levels of other pathogens that get into the crop. Okay. So in 2017, I started working with cocktails of biopesticide biostimulants that has shown some promise. So I wanted to look at not using just one biostimulant or this biostimulant or that, but using them in groups and applied to the plant. So I looked at two different types, what I call root biostimulants and leaf biostimulants, which is Bavaria bassiana and Streptomyces lyticus. And the root biostimulants were mycorrhizae and trichoderma. Uh, mostly harzianum, but uh, other trichoderma also. This was my field. Uh, this is my organic cantaloupe. Uh, I was very proud of this, so that's why I'm showing you a picture of it. It was a very nice field. Uh, this is the like, third or fourth year we've had uh, cantaloupe in this particular field uh, area. And it did very nicely. <clears throat> the problem is there were no significant difference. I had very little beetle numbers, and that's the problem at times. So the control is not significantly different from either of these. There were no significant differences between any of them. And, but with the yield, the control was, was significantly less than the root or leaf or the root leaf bioassay combined. And so we got, we see that stimulating effect. These are microorganisms now. And if you're interested in biostimulants, those are the ones I'd work with, the microorganisms. Not so much the chemicals, the amino acids, the, the, the other stimulants that they sell. Okay. The thing I'd recommend is you don't use biostimulants at this time. Uh, I think biostimulants are like biopesticides were about 10 years ago. And there was a lot of crap out there with biopesticides. A lot of them, most of them did not work or did not work very well. And over time, the dust seemed to settle. And so we, were, we start to see a lot more consistent results from the biopesticides that are present out there and for sale now. A lot of what's out there now for biostimulants is snake oil. I think a lot of you know this. And so that's what you have to be aware of. What do you mean by that snake oil? I mean, I know what snake oil means, but that means how that is the biostimulant no good? Because it doesn't have any effect on the plant. It hasn't been tested. It might have been tested. It might not have been tested. They're, selling it anyway. They're just selling it anyway. And usually they use testimonials from some grower that says this works great. And that's, that's their proof. So they'll come on, they'll come at you with a lot of uh, sales pitches. Uh, if, you, if you're real curious about biostimulants, you think there's something here, that's great. Uh, go ahead. But you got to do little infield comparisons on your farm. Don't, let's say you, you want to see if it helps your tomato crop. Don't spray it all 
your tomato crop with a biostimulant and say, well, it looks better than last year, because it doesn't. You, you cannot make that determination. So if you have four rows, uh, put it on two rows, and, but not the other two rows. Or put it on three rows, but not one row, or vice versa. Put it on one row, but not three rows. Just do something that you can see if there's a difference between where you used it and where you didn't. I don't care that you try it, just make sure that you have some proof that it actually worked for you. And a lot of this work that's being done now, and we're having a lot of uh, uh, conferences and things like that, and people are still not coming out with any good evidence that a lot of these biostimulants work. But there, there's always a hint, there's always a study somewhere that shows this, is, this worked fairly well. Like one of my studies, this has worked, but is it going to work consistently? And what people have found that at times the, the biostimulant will actually work with one cultivar and you switch cultivars and it doesn't work so well. So it, it could be cultivar specific. And if we get to, down to that, then we got real problems because then you're going to have to look at every cultivar that's popular and then compare that with all the biostimulants and see how well it could work. And you see that's going to take a long time to work out. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So you can go back to the, the main room if you like, or you can ask questions or do whatever you want. You mentioned the stem text. Are there other ones packaged things like that that you've used that you had success with? I've, other, I've used other seaweed products, but uh, they have not worked consistently as Stimplex. Uh, it, they've changed the name, they've changed the formulation like they always do. I think it's called Acadia now and not Stimplex. Okay. Yes, yeah. Have you, uh, slightly off topic, have you looked at the beneficial relationships between yields of plants in terms of how they stimulate growth? So the classic one being the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, and their, their interrelationship. Um, not so much in terms of what other products do, but is that an area of research that you know of anybody who's involved in? Uh, people have looked at that uh, over time, and there's probably more studies done back in the 80s than, uh, than more recently. I, I did a study uh, back looking at rotation uh, and how helpful it was, and one of the things I found uh, Rotations are, are better, the, the plant does better with a rotation in which the year before that crop has greater amount of mycorrhizae in its roots. That mycorrhizae over winters, if you will, and it's more available for that next crop and it becomes affected very quickly and um, those plants do better in that rotation versus another rotation in which the mycorrhizae does not build. That's, that's as much as other than the uh, legume or uh, grass type thing. More like you know, the simultaneous production split. Simultaneous, okay. No, I haven't looked at that. Not too many people are looking at that. You might try Saruti Hooks. Uh, he's looked at uh, intercropping with, uh, with live uh, intercrop. Yeah. Hey, some the, well, I heard from a guy who's trying to an algae stimulant product going here and I sent them to you. Did you ever hear from them and look at what they were trying to do at all? I'm trying to think. I, I think uh, we had a uh, conversation, uh, email conversation, and I asked him to send me results of a study. Never heard from him again. <laughs> and that happens uh, fairly frequently. Yeah. People talk about it and they, they want the university to talk this up and you know present it and talk about it and and I always say, well all right, show me your, your your evidence, show me your research. And nine times out of ten I never hear from them again. Yeah. 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 Um, I think one of your slides it was uh, talking about soil count it, was an application of 7,800 pounds per acre. That was Rutgers, yes. Um, what, what's the calculation to get that down per plant? If you were 
Oh, I have no idea how much how much that plant is going to take up. Uh, I'm sure you you could get it estimate what the area is of those roots, and then estimate how much of an acre that is, and then you could get an idea of how much silicone it was actually taken up. With a lot of these plants, yeah, with tomatoes, uh, uh, they're usually on a uh, two foot uh, row basis. And so you, you can do an estimate, two foot row, how much space is there between rows, usually six feet between row centers. And so you can get a little strip of land that that root is exposed to. But that's not real exact because you're, it's going to rob from the root, the, the one next to it and this one. And, but it, it gives you an estimate. Okay. What's that? I didn't consider it, but I was curious what you break it down to. How many people are thinking about using biostimulants or looking into them? I'm already bought some. Okay. Just don't apply it to the whole crop. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. It's a great idea to test by rows or beds, you know. That would be great. And it, if you think it does something and you think it helps, that's great. Yeah. I'm thinking something that grows fast, like the fish should try it on that first. So I'll see. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And um, you mentioned the foliar spray, of course, that's kind of steep, but do you have any other things you've used successfully? Uh, I mean, biostimulant wise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, other than the seedweed. And I have used the seaweed where I, I've sprayed it on. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do quite as well. It's not as consistent, let's put it that. I don't see as consistent results, mm -hmm. positive results, mm -hmm. as when I apply it to the roots. Mm -hmm. But other than that, mm -hmm. it's, it's a mixture of these microorganisms mm -hmm. and not chemicals that seem right. to work. Right, right, definitely. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, thank you for your questions. Sure. I appreciate it.